This is part 2 of the mini-series on Mora. In this video, you will learn the basics of haiku so that you can create some haiku yourself. In part 1, you learned how to segment words into moras and the differences between moras and syllables. If you missed part 1, click the suggestion above. Here is the structure of this video with timestamps. Section 1. Haiku First of all, what is haiku? Haiku is a traditional form of Japanese poetry that has existed for at least a few hundred years. It developed from its predecessor, Haikai. These two kanji, hai and kai, express the same ideas, namely silliness, fun, and humor. Haikai originally took the form of renga, which literally means linked songs or successive songs. Renga is also often called renku or linked phrases. Renga, in essence, is a game of association where one person reads a poem and, in response, another person creates a poem that is inspired by the previous poem, and this relay continues for 36 turns. In contrast to renga, a piece of haiku stands on its own, which allows haiku poets or haijin to express their creativity independently of other people. By the way, the final poem in a renga is called ageku, which is the origin of the phrase ageku no hate, which means in the end. Haiku has three main characteristics that you should know. 1. Go shichigo, the 575 rhythmic pattern. 2. Kigo, words that express seasons. 3. Kire, the concept of cut. Firstly, the most definitive feature of haiku is that it is a fixed verse form, or teikeishi. Normally, a haiku consists of 17 moras. It has three phrases, or ku, and these phrases have 5, 7, and 5 moras, respectively. This rhythmic pattern is commonly referred to as go shichigo. Each of the three phrases in a haiku has a special name. The first phrase is called kamigo, literally, upper five. The second phrase is called nakashichi, literally, middle seven. And the third phrase is called zago, or shimogo, meaning lower five. I would not be using these terms in this video, but I thought some of you might be interested in the jargon. Now, let's have a look at one of the most famous haiku by Matsuo Basho. Notes that Basho lived approximately 200 years before the invention of the term haiku, but his poems have all the characteristics of haiku, so it is common to refer to his poems as haiku. Furuikeya kawazu tobikomu mizu no oto. The first phrase, Furuikeya, has five moras. The second phrase, Kawazu tobikomu, has seven moras. The last phrase, Mizu no oto, has five moras. I believe the imagery of this haiku is pretty obvious. Now, I'm going to repeat this haiku a few times so that you can try saying it out loud with me and feel the go-shichigo rhythm. Furuikeya kawazu tobikomu mizu no oto. Furuikeya kawazu tobikomu mizu no oto. Furuikeya kawazu tobikomu mizu no oto. Not all haiku adhere to this rhythmic pattern, however. For example, one of the three phrases in a haiku may have one extra mora. This is called jiamari, which literally means word remainder or word left over. The opposite pattern also exists, that is, one phrase may have one mora missing. This is referred to as jitarazu, or literally, word lacking. Jiamari and jitarazu together are referred to as hacho or broken meter because they break the traditional rhythm of goshichigo. Here are examples of jiamari and jitarazu that I found on a website called Nihon Haiku Kenkyukai. Akai tsubaki. Shiroi tsubaki to ochinikeri. In this haiku, the first phrase, akai tsubaki, has six moras instead of five. Therefore, this haiku is jiamari. I'm going to repeat this haiku a few times. Akai tsubaki, shiroi tsubaki to ochinikeri. Akai tsubaki, shiroi tsubaki to ochinikeri. Akai tsubaki, shiroi tsubaki to ochinikeri. Niji ga deru, a hanasaki ni gunkan. The last phrase of this haiku, gunkan, has four moras instead of five. I'm going to repeat this haiku a few times. Niji ga deru, a hanasaki ni gunkan. Niji ga deru, a hanasaki ni gunkan. Niji ga deru, a hanasaki ni gunkan. It is important to remember that haiku that are either jiamari or jitarazu are sometimes considered inferior to ones that follow the standard go shigo rhythmic pattern. Therefore, it is recommended that you should only use jiamari or jitarazu intentionally as a technique to achieve a particular effect, rather than as a result of your inability to condense your idea into 70 moras. The second crucial feature is that a haiku usually contains a kigo, a word that indicates or implies the season of the poem. 
Kigo can be anything that is typically associated with a particular season, including food items, plants, fish, insects, birds, clothes, seasonal festivities and activities, diseases that spread in a particular season, celestial activities, and so on. The majority of Kigo are pretty straightforward. For example, the word yuki snow is obviously associated with winter, while sakura cherry blossom symbolizes spring. However, it can be quite difficult at times to tell which season a given word expresses. For example, which season do you associate ants with? They can be seen throughout the year, but apparently ants indicate summer. Some kigo can also be misleading. For instance, the word koharu, which literally says little spring, is a kigo of winter, not of spring. This is because koharu is an archaic term for the 10th month of the lunisolar calendar, which corresponds to a period between November and early December in the Gregorian calendar. You also need to be familiar with Japanese customs and traditions in order to be able to tell which season a word implies. For example, undokai, an athletic festival or a sports day at school, is a kigo of autumn because undokai used to be commonly held in autumn. Now, you might be wondering why Kigo is even necessary, but it is important to keep in mind that the four distinct seasons of Japan are integral to Japanese culture and how Japanese people have traditionally interacted with both nature and other individuals. In traditional Japanese poetry and literature, seasons are almost always mentioned, or at least implied. Even in personal letters, it is customary to refer to the change of seasons at the beginning as a greeting and as a way of expressing concerns for the recipient's health. In Renga, the predecessor of haiku, the norm was to specify the season in the first poem, or hokku. Given that haiku originated from this hokku, it is easy to imagine why this rule was also applied to haiku, and why this rule remains to this day. Now that we know the basics of kigo, let's revise the examples from above, and identify each haiku's season. Furuike ya kawazu tobikomu mizu no oto. The kigo in this haiku is kawazu, which may indicate either spring or summer. However, it is commonly assumed that this particular haiku is set in spring. Akai tsubaki, shiroi tsubaki to ochi ni keri. The kigo of this haiku is tsubaki, camellia. Similarly to sakura, tsubaki is a symbol of spring. Niji ga deru, aa hanasaki ni gunkan. This time, it is not so obvious, but niji or rainbow is the kigo in this poem. Although rainbows are not exclusive to any particular season, they are associated with summer. Here's one extra haiku that we haven't seen yet. Kakikueba kane ga naru nari horyuji. The kigo of this poem is persimmon. Although uncommon in the West, persimmons are a popular fruit in Japan and they are eaten in autumn. The third and final characteristic of haiku is that every haiku must have a kire or literally a cut. Kire basically refers to where you will put a full stop or a period within the poem. The position where a full stop can be placed is called kireme. Kire has two main functions. 1. Kireme indicates the most important phrase of a haiku, that is, kireme shows us what the poet found emotionally moving and or aesthetically pleasing, as well as what the haiku is about. 2. By inserting a brief pause, or ma, kire makes the reader curious about what's going to come next, and also allows them to let their imagination run free. This helps the haiku feel more captivating and impactful to the reader. Although not always necessary, there are a set of particles called kireji, which explicitly indicate the kireme of a haiku. The most common kireji are ya, keri, and kana. Ya is normally preceded by a noun, but it can sometimes follow a verb, an adjective, an adjectival verb, or an auxiliary verb. It tends to appear at the end of the first phrase in a haiku, and indicates admiration, surprise, and so on. Keri follows either a verb, an adjective, an adjectival verb, or an auxiliary verb. And unlike ya, it cannot follow a noun. Keri expresses a completed action, so you can think of it as either the simple past tense or the present perfect. Keri tends to appear at the end of a haiku, and this is why the phrase keri o tsukeru means to put an end to something. Kana is similar to ya in that it can follow a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adjectival verb, or an auxiliary verb, while it is similar to keri in the sense that it appears at the end of a haiku. Kana expresses a deep, lingering sense of admiration or amazement. Be careful that kana in contemporary Japanese expresses question or curiosity, while kana in haiku doesn't. Now, let's go back to the examples above once again and identify the kireme in each of them. Furuike ya kawazu tobikomu mizu no oto. Ya is one of the three most common kireji, so you will put a full stop after ya. 
Yeah has various meanings, but in this context, it expresses the poet's admiration of the scenery, depicted in the poem. I am not a very poetic person, so I don't know the correct or intended interpretation of this poem, but this ya creates a slight pause and allows you to visualize a calm and quiet pond, but this tranquil imagery is subsequently betrayed by the leaping movement of the frog and the resulting sound. Akai tsubaki, shiroi tsubaki to ochi ni keri. This haiku also contains one of the most common kiriji, namely keri. Keri also has many meanings, but in this poem, it shows that the camellia flowers have just fallen onto the ground. Since keri is a kireji, and kireji identifies what the poet found beautiful or moving, I believe the poet saw the red camellia flower drop, which was immediately followed by the white camellia flower, and he found this contrasting imagery and the ephemeral beauty of the flowers breathtaking. Niji ga deru, a hanasaki ni gunkan. This haiku does not contain one of the 18 kireji, but it is obvious where you should put a full stop, because the first phrase, niji ga deru, ends in the shushike or the dictionary form, deru, come out, emerge. The interpretation of this haiku is very difficult, and there is not much information on the internet about this poem, and I have no idea what the context of this poem is, so I'll leave it up to you to interpret this haiku. Kakikueba, kane ga naru nari, horyuji. This haiku again does not have one of the 18 kireji, but nari in kane ga naru nari is in the shushike or the dictionary form, so there would be a full stop after nari. Nari tells us that the sound of the bell seems to be coming from horyuji. Kakikueba means while eating a persimmon, so the poet was eating a persimmon when he suddenly heard the bell ring, and this sound made him think, wow, what a beautiful autumn day. One bonus haiku that we haven't seen yet. Samazama no koto omoidasu sakura kana. This haiku contains the kireji, kana, and the kigo of this haiku is sakura. I believe this poem is very straightforward. Looking at this cherry blossom tree reminds the poet of many things that happened in the past related to the tree. Kana at the end expresses a deep and lingering sense of nostalgia that the cherry blossom tree evokes in the poet's mind. So far, I have talked about the three most important features of haiku. There are still a few minor details that you should know. 1. Haiku is written in bungo or archaic formal language. Therefore, if you use contemporarily casual Japanese or kōgō, it doesn't feel authentic. What this implies for a learner of Japanese is that haiku is very challenging to master. This is why I would recommend starting with sendu, which is the topic of section 2. 2. When creating a haiku, you need to make sure that the other words and expressions are plain and clear. It is generally recommended that you should avoid proper nouns that the reader may not know about. Haiku is not a genre where you show off your ability to concoct complex and abstruse expressions. You can think of haiku like a joke. If you need to explain your joke, then it is not a good joke. 3. Haiku are often likened to realistic sketches. They are realistic in the sense that they are meant to depict and convey exactly what you perceive, and they are like sketches in the sense that they can be rough around the edges, and they lack in detail. 4. In haiku, you shouldn't explicitly state how you feel. Instead, you need to allow your reader to infer your emotions. This is the end of section 1. Feel free to leave a comment below and share your haiku.